Well, as we continue our study in 1 Corinthians, it just happens that Paul's talking about liberties and uh, limits of the liberties that a Christian may have. And uh, we want to take a look at this and see if we can understand it more fully. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, Christians aren't under the law. Uh, but uh, some people uh, have sort of interpreted that Christians can do whatever they please. And that's not so at all. And we need to understand a little bit about what Christian liberty is and what it isn't. And so what we're going to do is look at liberty understood first and see if we can figure it out. The cliche that was being used in Paul's day was, uh, was uh, you know, that they're not under law, they're free, uh, and that they can do as they, they please. All things are lawful for me. But really that's a misuse of what God intended. Uh, when we talk about a cliche, it's just a trite way of expressing an idea and you hear it over and over again and, uh, and, and it sort of catches on, but you have to think behind what it is saying. 1 Corinthians 6.12, all things are lawful for me. Oh, I can do this. That's lawful. I can do this. All things are lawful. Well, it says all things, you know, and therefore I can do all things. And that's really uh, a, a, what the Corinthian church began saying as they were hearing preaching that they're not under the law, but what they began to assume was they could do anything which would make them outlaws, that is doing things that are contrary to the will of God. And Paul is correcting that kind of thinking. And so uh, the idea is, even though you are under grace, it doesn't give you permission to do anything you please to do. And so Paul has been a great proponent of preaching. You're not under the law, you're under grace, but now he has to sort of give the balance of what that means to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 20, here's how he preached to the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win Jews. Those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. And so uh, they, they, they heard those terms and they took them further than Paul intended them to be. Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. And, and he's again saying, he's not saying we're outlaws, we can do anything we please. He's saying we're not under the Mosaic system of the Old Testament. Colossians 2.20. If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if, so, you, why if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? Do not touch, do not eat. And, you know, we're not under the law. The other day I had a, a nice ham dinner. If I was under the law, guess what I wouldn't have? I definitely wouldn't have had ham because that would have been one, a violation of the Old Testament law. We're not under that law, but we are under the moral principles of that law. We need to understand the difference and the distinction. Augustine put it this way, love God and do as you please, but now... Oh, if you're not careful, you might take that far further down the road than he intended for you to understand that. And we need to be careful. There's a saying going around modern Christians today that's something like this, and it's a sort of sometimes in a flippant way. It's under the blood. It's under the blood. I'm dying. I'm going to heaven. I'm a believer. It's under the blood. I would like to suggest it's it maybe under the blood but I would like to suggest that there's some amazing consequences for Christians who walk contrary to the moral principles of God. And we'll see that a little as we go on. So everything is permissible means, as Paul explained it, the believer is not under the restraints and regulations of the Mosaic law, but we still have restraints and regulations in our life. It's under the blood means that there is no sin that can separate me from eternal life given to the believer in salvation. Jesus said, nothing can separate you, no one can snatch them out of my hands, I give to you eternal life. That's a wonderful truth, but it does not give me license to sin, and it does not mean there are no consequences, temporal and eternal, for sin, and, and, and I'm talking about sin that we commit after we have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. And there are consequences, temporal and eternal, and we'll look a little bit at that in the message too. What his point is this, liberty has limitations. And we need to understand that. Let me give you an example. I was in the Navy, 
And uh, as a Navy, I was part of the military, U.S. military, and I had taken an oath, and uh, uh, I, I had what went all the things that went wrong with li the military rules and regulations. But once in a while, we would pull up to a shore, some country maybe, and they would say, you have liberty, you can go on liberty. And so we would get dressed, and we'd go up, out on the land, and we'd explore the nation that we were in, whatever the case may be. Now, the fact that I was on liberty, did that mean I could do whatever I pleased? I could tell you that the uh, military code of justice would have dealt with me rather swiftly had I done things that were contrary. And you'd often hear this, do not disgrace the uniform. You are a member of the U.S. Navy. Do not disgrace the uniform. And so while I was at liberty, it doesn't mean I was at liberty to do anything. It meant I didn't have to report for duty that particular day. I was free to wander around the island or the nation we were in. But I also had responsibility as a military person. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. The early church says, we're under grace, we're under grace. And, and that's true, so are we. But they had to understand what grace meant. And it didn't mean license. And so Paul writes in Romans 6, 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Because he says grace covered so much, and it did. And it brought you to Christ, and you say, what about my past? It was forgiven. But now, oh, I'm under grace. It doesn't mean I can do anything. What it means is that I am now under the lordship of, of Jesus Christ. And so liberty understood. Let's understand the cliche that is often used is un we're under the blood. All things are lawful for me does not mean I can do anything I wish without consequences or without dishonoring the name of God. And so I need to be careful how I live my life. Now he's going to bring some correction into them. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12, he says, all things are lawful for me, but notice this, but not all things are helpful. Okay, you got your say and all things are lawful, but have you thought about some things are not really very good for you? They're not very helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. Well, there goes a number of good arguments in the world for legalizing marijuana. I will not be dominated by anything. Legalizing things that are harmful, well, that would be a political argument, but here's the spiritual argument. I will not be dominated, whether it be drugs, food, sex, television, sports, I will not be dominated by anything. There's only one person that should dominate my life. You know who that is? That's the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the one who should dominate my life. And so he's giving some examples. And in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we see one of those examples. They're taking the Lord's table. Now they're serving the bread and they're serving the wine. Of course, this was actual wine. Uh, in those days, the wine was nine parts water, one part alcohol. It took a lot to get drunk, but look what was happening. 1 Corinthians 11:21. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. Now, that's a, they're eating and they're robbing others who can't get there on time. They're taking the best of the food, and that's not very kind. But notice this next line. Another gets drunk. Now, all things are lawful, aren't they? No. Does God frown upon bad behavior of his children? Yes. What does he do about it? Well, the very next verse tells me some things that God does. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 11.30. That is why many of you are weak. You're not only weak spiritually, you're weak physically because you're not willing to live under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And he said some are ill. Some of the illness that we experience in our life, not all, but some, is a discipline process to get us back on track with God. And then he says this, and some have died. In other words, if we persist in our sin, God is not going to simply say, oh, you all things are lawful, you under grace, do as you please. Not at all. God is a loving heavenly father, steps in and takes action. And so this is what Paul said, some are weak, some are ill, some have died. In chapter 10, we will see why we limit our freedoms because we're concerned about the example we set for others when we get to chapter 10. Sometimes we restrict our freedoms because it would hinder someone else's walk with God. We might say, I think that's okay. And someone else might say, I don't think that's okay. I don't want to do that. And we all, come on, what's wrong with you? Don't do that. We'll talk about that when we get to chapter 10.
10, restricting your freedom for the benefit of another believer. But the real issue is this, who you serve. You never have any trouble with living the right kind of life if you've settled that issue. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. You either serve Jesus or you serve yourself. You can't have it both ways. And if you serve Jesus, then you govern your life according to the word of God, and you make your choices based on that. Philip Brooks put it this way, no man in this world attains to freedom from any slavery except by entrance into some higher servitude. There is no such thing as an entirely free man conceivable. In other words, I belong to Jesus. If I belong to Jesus, I've now become a servant of Christ. If I'm a servant of Christ, not wanting to be double-minded or I can't serve two masters, I'm not going to serve something that would lead me into a path of sin. And, and, and of course, Paul uses immorality in this particular case. No, I'm a servant of Christ, and because I'm a servant of Christ, I say no to things that would be harmful and morally incorrect. That's what God is calling us to do and how he calls us to live. So we looked at liberty understood. Now I want to look at purity underscored. What does it mean to live a pure life for the Lord Jesus Christ? Because that's what Paul says in the text. In chapter 6, he talks about purity. So we're going to look at uh, what it means. And here's what I need to know. I'm going to give you six facts that will help you live a pure life before God. Here's the first one. Liberty is not license. Liberty is not license. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. You were called to freedom, but freedom should never be abused. And in the Corinthian church, they were abusing their freedoms. If we just go through quickly some of the chapters, in chapters 1 through 4, the, the Christians were quarreling with one another. They were fighting with one another. Not the proper use of freedom. We should love one another, yield to one another, be kind-hearted, and all these things. Chapter 5, there was an immoral man. Remember he said, there is a man in your congregation is doing something that even the pagans wouldn't do. He, he was sleeping with his stepmother. And he said, you have become proud rather than bring correction in his life. Oh, we're so lovey-dovey. No, no. You need to tell him there's a limit to freedom. And freedom is not license. Chapter 6, lawsuits and immoral practices. We're going to look at that in moral practices this week. And, and those are some things that Christians were getting upset with Christians over petty little things, dragging them into court, getting angry with them, doesn't belong. In moral practices, we'll talk about that, doesn't belong. Chapter 8, misuse of freedom, meat offered to idols, and they were, they were telling people who were skeptical, oh, you can do this, you can do this, and, and it's okay if you know something is right to do it, but if you're with a Christian brother who doesn't, feel it's right, a Christian sister who has strong objections, then you curb your freedom for the benefit of that brother or sister. We'll look at that when we get to chapter 8 and chapter 10. Chapter 10 also, drunk, selfishness at the Lord's table. You would think of all places the best Christian behavior would be at the communion table, wouldn't you? And yet in chapter 10, you're going to find that some of the worst Christian behavior happened at the communion table, and Paul had to tell them about correction. 1 Peter 2.15, For this is the will of God, that you, by doing good, you shall put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Our lives should be lived in a holy, careful way that we represent Christ. And everywhere we go, we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 Peter 2.16, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. So, we're looking at six facts you need to know that we're finding in chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians to live a pure life. Here's the second one. Sex apart from marriage is wrong. That's the second one. Sex apart from marriage is wrong. 1 Corinthians 6.18. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but sexual, the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Then he says in 1 Corinthians 7, 2, that we are people who get tempted. Uh, sexual temptation is very strong, and it's a reality of the human life. So what does he say? Well, he's going to say a lot, and we're going to look at this next week, 
when we look at marriage, divorce, and remarriage in chapter 7. But he gives us a little hint in 1 Corinthians 7 too. Because of temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. What is he saying? He's saying you start dating and, and it's getting hot and heavy. Here's what you have to do. You have to learn to be restraining because God does not want you to be active in sexual activity unless you're married. And now you're dating a few months and you're both out of school, you're working, you have jobs, and you say, oh, what should we do? Well, you shouldn't go to bed. You should get married. That's what he says. You should get married. And, you, and listen, let me say this. If a guy wants to have sex with you, or a girl wants to have sex with you, and they're not willing to marry you, do you really want to do that? See, the God has some pretty high standards here. Put a ring on the finger. Make a commitment of life one to the other. And decide to serve the Lord in your life. 1 Thessalonians 4.1 Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. How do you please God? More and more. Look what he says in the next verse. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Verse 3. For this is the will of God your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. God has some very clear... Listen, my wife said to me she's going to have to mess, miss next week because I'm going to talk about sex and marriage. She said she's going to stay home. I remember one, one Sunday I was preaching on the subject and my kids used to charge me a dollar every time I mentioned their name. And, uh, and I knew I was preaching on the subject, so I held up a $20 bill. I said, this is for my wife, because when I'm done, I'm going to owe her 20 bucks. And, uh, but the reality is, sex is God's plan in the right place. It's like fire in the fireplace. Beautiful. Fire burning your house down, not so beautiful. And we need to understand what God's plan is for that. Ephesians 5.3, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetedness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. All things are lawful. It's not lawful for me to have a covetous heart. It's not lawful to participate in sexual immorality. It's not lawful to steal. It's not lawful to die. Yes, I am under the blood. You are under the blood. We are forgiven in Christ, but there are consequences, temporal and eternal, when we decide to live our lives our way instead of realizing that we are subjects of Christ. Now, I'd like to make a point here that will help us. And here's the point. Much of what the Corinthians were doing was legal. Prostitution was legal in, in that era in the, in the Corinthian church, in the, in the town of Corinth. And so, ah, Paul, don't you know this is legal? Let me say this. What is legal is not the same as what is moral. There are many things in our country that are legal and they are not moral. Let's take a look at some of them. Abortion is legal, but it is not morally correct. How about pornography? You can go into a store, I suppose, and buy a magazine that's pornographic. It's legal, but it's not morally right. Same-sex civil unions or marriages, legal, but not morally right. Sex without marriage is legal. Uh, nobody's going, if, if a young couple moves in together and, and sets up house together, nobody's going to put handcuffs on them and drag them out. However, while it is legal, it is morally wrong. Even some tax shelters may be legal, but they're morally wrong. And legality matters to some people, but morality should matter to the body of Christ. We should be wanting to live moral, pure, holy lives for the cause of Christ. Now let's reverse that a little bit. Sometimes something that is illegal is morally correct for you to do. Let me give you an example. Coy ten Boon was a person from the Netherlands when the Nazis came in and invaded. And they realized that they were taking Jews away to concentration camps. Many of them were being shot and executed. So Corey and her family decided to hide Jews in their house. Legally right? No. Morally right? 100%. And they hid Jews in their house until finally they were discovered and their whole family was put in, in prison concentration camps and many of them died. 
as a result of their willingness to rescue Jews that were being persecuted by the Germans during the war. Morally right, legally against the law, but not against God's law. So we have to learn to sort these kinds of things out. So in Corinth, prostitution was legal and acceptable, but not for a Christian. And so be careful. It's not right for us to do some things. Colossians 3.5, put to death, therefore, what is earthly in your sexual, immor earthly in your sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. He's writing to believers. On account of these things, you and I, when we have asked Christ into our lives, he became our Lord and Savior. He also is our sovereign. We are obliged to obey the moral principles that God lays out. And he gives a strong warning there. Now, the third fact you need to know, sex is not condemned, but confined. It's not condemned, but confined. 1 Corinthians 6.13 Food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food. But God will destroy one and the other. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Does that mean God is opposed to sex or against sex? The answer is no, not at all. He's opposed to sex out of context. In context, he's very much in favor of it. 1 Corinthians 7, 4. The wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Now listen to this next line. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement. We just had a day of fasting, maybe by agreement, for a limited time, that you may devote yourself to prayer, but then come together again, so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. God is not contrary to sex. He's contrary to sex that will destroy us and hurt us and miss the mark of his holiness. Next fact that we want to know, struggling singles should run to the altar. If you are single and you are dating and you are struggling with immorality, you ask that person if they're willing to marry you. If they say no, here's what you should be singing to them. Hit the road, Jack. Don't come back. No more, no more, no more. If someone wants you to have a sexual relationship and they're not willing to marry you, what does that say? It says that there's something wrong in that relationship. 1 Corinthians 6.18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. It says flee. Remember in, in the book of Genesis, Joseph is in the house of Potiphar, and Potiphar's wife has an eye on him, grabs him, says, come lay with me. What does Joseph do? He puts on his Nike sneaks, and he gets out. Get out. Run. And, and if you need to run from a situation, run. If you need to say this, this, this relationship is over, make it over. But do not compromise on moral principles. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Of course, someone said the problem with living sacrifices is they keep crawling off the altar. No, you are a living sacrifice. You live for God. Look what he says in the next verse. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Change how you think. I am a servant of the living God. I will live a holy life as unto the living God. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's how we ought to be living our lives. And Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, if you're dating somebody and you've been dating a while and you're tempted to cross the line, here's what he says. If they cannot exercise self-control, they should what? Marry. That's what he says. They shall marry. They should make that commitment to one another. For it is better to marry than to burn. He doesn't give us another option. If you want to please God, you live in a right relationship the way you ought to live. 
Now, some people today are saying, well, you know, you need to check the waters before you get married. You need to do something here. You need to know what you do. No, no. Uh, listen, there's an organization called First Things First that studies all these kinds of things. And they've come up with some conclusions. Now, they came up with a bunch of them, but I'm only going to share three. Here's the first one. Uh, first things first, myths about living together. Here's the first myth. Living together will give us a stronger marriage. Truth, although many couples think that moving in together can give them a great head start in their marriage, living together can actually harm your marriage. Couples who live together, listen to this now, before they marry have a divorce rate that is 50% higher than those who don't. That's amazing, isn't it? You listen, you want the best chance in life, live by the rules of God. That's what God wants us to do. Here's the second myth. Your sex life goes downhill when you get married. Truth. The level of sexual satisfaction is higher among married couples than for couples who live together. Couples who live together tend to be less faithful to their partners than married couples. Next truth. It's only temporary. <clears throat> truth. Many people enter a cohabitant relationship hoping they will be married soon. However, living together isn't always a stepping stone to marriage. Statistics report that 60% of couples who live together will not go on to get married. Either they break up 39% or just continue to live together. Living together is not a guarantee of marital bliss or the best things in the world. Here's the next one. Sex is not just a physical act. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16. Do you not know that he who joined that that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. Now here's the here's the deal. We are one with Christ. When you accepted Jesus, if you're here last week and Sam preached. When you accepted Jesus, the Holy Spirit came to live within you. Now, here's a deterrent to sin that'll be really helpful. Every time you go to do something that is out of line with the will of God, guess who's with you? The Holy Spirit. Just picture him alongside of you for a minute. Think about doing an act of immorality with the Holy Spirit sitting next to you. Would you do that? No. You would say, I can't do that. God is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my guide. He directs, he leads me, he instructs me, he convicts me of sin and righteousness and judgment to come. The Holy Spirit lives within you. That's why the Bible says when a Christian sins, they grieve the Holy Spirit, they quench the Holy Spirit. And you want to know that you're not grieving or quenching the Holy Spirit. You are one with Christ, and you want to live a holy life as God would have you live. Number six, fact number six, sexual sin dishonors God. 1 Corinthians 6.15 Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never! 16. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For it is written the two will become one flesh. Something happens in sexual relationships. Now, I'm happy to say I've been married for 48 years. I still get up in the morning, and my wife looks at me. We look at each other. We kiss each other. We love each other. It's a great way to go. Do you know why? We have become knit together. Knit together. 48 years, we're knit together. And that's what God has intended for marriage, that knitting together. But when you are in a relationship with someone you're not married with, it says that you become in a sort of one flesh relationship. And that's a very serious thing. And God says, don't do it. Verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Verse 18 then warns us, flee, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. What a great tragedy. And God has provided for us freedom, holiness. I could go through a lot of statistics of what happens, particularly with single motherhood, and the struggles and the agony of that kind of life where you're raising your kids and there's no father around. It's very difficult. And, and uh, though we try and help people along the way, the reality is it's complicated. And God says, here's the way, flee. Flee. 
from these things. So we looked at liberty understood. We're looking at purity underscored, what I need to know. Now we're going to talk about what I need to do. What do I need to do? 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you? I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. God lives within me. And he says, don't you know that? Whom you are, you are from God. You are not your own. For you are bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. It's like when I was in the Navy and I'm in uniform. I realized everywhere I went, I'm representing the U.S. Navy. Everywhere I went, I know that I'm under the, the, the rules and the regulations of the U.S. Navy. Well, now I have the, 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 I've been clothed with Christ. I have the mind of Christ. I, God's Holy Spirit lives within me. Everywhere I go, I represent the Holy Spirit. How important is that? And so I know that I should honor God. I should honor God in my modesty, my purity, my speech, what I watch on television, what I'll listen to, where I'll go, where I won't go, what I'll do, what I won't do. I want to use my body in every way to glorify God. That, incidentally, is the fullest, richest life you could live. All use of our body should honor God, and sexual sin has unique seriousness to it. Jimmy Chapman was a, ba is a Baptist pastor, and here's what he wrote. Imagine waking up in the morning and finding that your neighbor has built a fence in the corner of your front yard and has moved in some hogs. It then began to rain, and in a few hours, your rich green lawn is turned into a swamp of mud and filth. Your outrage would certainly be justified to use the property of another against his consent and for the purpose which are dishonoring to him is both inconsiderate and illegal. In the same manner, the body of the believer is not his. It belongs to the Lord. Remember as kids you used to sing, be careful little eyes what you see, be careful little ears what you hear, be careful little feet where you go. You belong to Jesus. And because you belong to Jesus, you live your life with the understanding that you are a believer in Christ. And what you do, what you say, how you live matters for the glory of God. There are limits on liberty. I want to close with a prayer that Peter Marshall prayed. Peter Marshall was, uh, the, uh, uh, worked in the Senate as a chaplain for many, many years, wrote great articles. And I just want to close with a little prayer that he wrote many years ago. Listen to what he said. Lord Jesus, thou who art the way, the truth, and the life. Hear us as we pray for the truth that, you, that shall make all free. Teach us that liberty is not only to be loved, but also to be lived. Liberty is too precious a thing to be burned, buried in the books. It costs too much to be hoarded. Help us see that our liberty is not the right to do as we please, but the opportunity to please, opportunity to please to do what is right. That's the liberty of the believer, to please to do what is right. Let's pray together. Lord, help us to... We live in a world that is broken and fallen, and you've rescued us. You've, you've opened our eyes. We've seen the glory of the gospel. We've discovered what it is to bow to the Lord Jesus Christ and ask for salvation. Now let us live our lives in a manner that is worthy of our high calling in everything that we do. Be glorified, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and God bless you.